isn't it good to be in church? Don't make me cry. Where else would you rather be? What else would you rather be doing? Anybody have anything? Nothing. Nothing. Oh, man, thank you, Lord. Well, what an honor it is today to, don't make me cry. breathe. What an honor it is today to, to um, be trusted to speak to you, to be trusted to speak to our family, our church um, that the Lord's given us. And whew, it's awesome. I don't take it lightly. It's uh, super weighty to me that um, Jeremy and Sarah would Trust me to do this, to speak into your lives today, to go before the Lord, to get a word from God, a word from heaven, and to minister it to you today. So would you join with me in faith, our eyes on Jesus, our eyes up on the things of heaven today, that we would receive wisdom, we would receive knowledge by a spirit by his word, by his help today, and that we would leave change today. We would leave stirred up. Do you want to get stirred up today? Man, life is awesome. And what the Lord's given us is awesome. And if you don't think that, then I hope that you leave today thinking differently, stirred up, ready to do all that he's called you to do. When I went before the Lord this week, I guess it was actually started the week before this week, um, and asking what he would have me share. This is, this is the message that I believe he gave me to, to speak to all of us, myself included, to our church, is to talk about the church. Talk about the church. I want to ask you a few questions this morning, and uh, then I'm going to give you the answer right off the bat. Thank you, Lord, for your help. Thank you, Lord, for your help. Do you know who you are? Do you know where you're from? Do you know what you're a part of? And do you know, do you know the days that you're living in? Thank you, Lord. The Bible talks about three different groups of people, and those three different groups, we'll look at it in a second, but it's the Jews and the Gentiles and the church. Do you know who you are? Let me give you an answer. I am, you are, a new creation. Do you know where you're from? You are a citizen of heaven. Do you know what you're a part of? You are a part of the church, the body. Woo! Woo, it's awesome. You're a part of the church, the body of Christ. You're a part of the church, the bride of Christ. And do you know what days you're living in? You're living in the last days, also called the latter days, also called the end of days, also called the days of the church. We're living in the church age. Woo, and we are the church. Are you stirred up? Legacy Church is not the church. Legacy Church is a part of the church I'm happy to have a part. Are you happy to have a part today? Awesome. Let's look at um, 1 Corinthians 10.32. I'm going to read out of the New Living. It's just easier for me to read. uh, The New Living. So 1 Corinthians 10.32. Is it up on the screen? I'm almost there. Um, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 32 says, Don't give offense to the three groups. 
the Jews, the Gentiles, or the church? We are, we are the church. Let's look at, um, let's look at the nations. Let's go to uh, Genesis 10. We're going to be going through scriptures today. I hope you got your Bible. I hope you're licking your fingers. Genesis 10, chapter 10 and verse 32. Uh, we can just read in the beginning of chapter 10. Um, it says, this is the account of the families of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, however you say it, the three sons of Noah. Many children were born to them after the great flood. And then it goes on to talk about each of those and all their descendants. You get down to verse 32, and it says that these are the clans that descended from Noah's sons, arranged by nation according to their lines of descent. All the nations of the earth descended from these clans after the great flood. All the nations of the earth, the earth, the earth, where are we citizens of? Heaven. All the nations of the earth came from these clans. Let's move over to Genesis, it's like right here, I don't have to turn at all, Genesis um, chapter 11. This is how the, the world, the nations, act. The nations is also translated in the Bible as Gentiles, so we read about Gentiles, sometimes it says Greeks, but the Gentiles, the people of the nations, um, basically it says the heathen. People that aren't of God. Um, okay, chapter 11. Genesis 11, and we're going to... Let's read at verse 3. It's talking about the nations, the Gentiles. They began saying to each other, Let us make bricks and harden them with fire. Verse 4, then they said, Come, let's, let us build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. Let us, let us build within ourselves a great city. This is the way the world thinks. This is an earthly viewpoint. This is an earthly way, is to try to build something from within yourselves, out of your own power. Even to this day, even if you're a believer, you still have to be renewed and think differently. To not live according to this world, but to live differently. We don't want to build something within ourselves out of our own might, out of our own strength, out of our own power. It will fall. We want, to build, we want God to build something in us. Let's go over to um, Genesis 11.27. This is awesome. Genesis eleven twenty seven. Abram comes on the scene. It says, this is the account of Terah's family. Terah was the father of Abraham. Let's move on to verse, or chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, your nation, whatever you're a part of, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you, and I, the Lord, will make you into a great nation. The Lord will make Abram, you, into a great nation. This verse is talking about the Jews, the Jewish nation. One, a great nation. Let's go to chapter 11. Oh, no, we're in 11. Let's go further in chapter 11. No, we're not in 11. We're in 12. Where are we? <laughs> Genesis 12. Okay, we're going to Genesis 17. A couple pages. <laughs> this is awesome. All right, so we've seen the nations. We've seen the Jewish nation. This is cool. Genesis 17. It says, when Abram 
was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and he said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty, serve me faithfully and live a blameless life and I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee you to give you countless descendants. God's already told him something before, this is something different. At this time, Abram fell face down on the ground. Then God said to him, this is my covenant with you, that I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. Not just one nation, I'll make you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will become many nations and kings will be among them. What's he talking about? Who is our father in the faith? Woo! I thought that was awesome, and then I found out the Bible like says it really clearly. And <laughs> Let's see, where is that? Romans 4, 16. It literally says, this is what the scripture means when God told him. I have made you the father of many nations, the father of all who believe, our father in the faith. What is, who makes up the church? Who makes up the church? Let's look at um, Ephesians 2. Everybody doing good? Cool. Ephesians chapter 2. It's like we're having a little Bible study this morning. It's awesome. <laughs> Ephesians 2 and verse, um, oh, should we just start? Let's just start at 11. It says, don't forget that you Gentiles, you nations, used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. We have a circumcision of the heart now. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises that God made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope, but now you've been united with Christ once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near through the blood of Jesus. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. The church is made up of people that have received Jesus from, if you're a Jew, it's also made up of those who have received Jesus from all the other nations, the Gentiles. The church is made up of the Jews and the Gentiles. We are a new creation. We are something that they didn't know about in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, you only see the Jews and the Gentiles prophecies about the church, although they didn't really get it. But we're new. Later we'll look at it, it says that we were a secret. We were hidden. They didn't know about us. We're aliens. We're weird. We're strange. A new creation. Let's move on. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Are you happy to be a new creation today? Oh, all things, woo, old things passed away. All things are new to us. Man, we got it good. Where's Colossians? Somebody, somebody help me. <laughs> thank you. No, seriously, thank you. Okay, I, I can't find it. Um, <laughs> I got it on my paper here. I'll read it. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Did you know that you've been transferred from an earthly kingdom to a heavenly kingdom? Colossians 1.13 says, For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness, and he transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. 
What did Jesus say about this? That's what I want to know. John, I know where that's at. Let's go to John. <laughs> oh, he's helping us. Thank you, Lord. John chapter 3. And let's look at, oh, we'll just start at the beginning. There was a man named Nicodemus. I love Nicodemus, probably because I grew up on Gospel Bill. Oh, somebody. Okay. Me and my little boy Titus, we watch Gospel Bill together every night. And I laugh and I cry and I learn about the Word of God. It's awesome. The other night he asked me, you know, like later in the series, a dog shows up and it's just walking around talking. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay. (laughs) Titus goes, Dad? What's that dog doing? It's like, um, he's living his life in dry gulch. I don't know. He's like, why, why is he talking? It's like, listen, just watch the show. Just watch the show. It's awesome. Okay, Rome, wait, where are we at? Somebody tell me where we are. John 3. Yes. What did Jesus say? What did Jesus say about being transferred from an earthly kingdom to a heavenly kingdom. Man, this is cool. We'll start at the beginning. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evident that God is with you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, You cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, he he said. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? This is weird. (laughs) Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, without being born of water and the spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to to spiritual life. Verse 3, he said, you can't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. We're going to look at this again later, this word, but that word again, listen, I am no Greek scholar here, but I did look this up. It's the word anovin, which means from above, from a higher place, or from heaven. To be born from above, to be born from a higher place, to be born from heaven. Philippians 3.20. Have you had enough scriptures yet? Me either. Let's go. Let's go. Philippians 3.20. says, we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. Are you waiting for the Lord? Come on. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own. Verse 20, we are citizens of heaven. Did you know that heaven is a real place? And whenever you receive Jesus, you are now a citizen. You are born from heaven. Talks about we are ambassadors on this earth. We are not in heaven. We are of heaven. We are from heaven. Does your citizenship matter? Anybody been reading their chapter? All right, let's look over at Acts 22. We read this the other day. I thought this was cool. Okay. Paul's just going through it. Acts 22, and I don't know why I'm saving that place. Acts 22... Let's start in verse 24. 
The commander brought Paul inside and ordered him lashed with whips to make him confess his crime. Anybody remember reading this a couple was it days or weeks ago? I can't remember, a week or so ago. He wanted to find out why the crowd had become so furious. When they tied Paul down to lash him, Paul said to the officer standing there, Is it legal for you to whip a Roman citizen who hasn't ever been tried? When the officer heard this, he went to the commander and he asked, What are you doing? <laughs> this man is a Roman citizen. Verse 27, so the commander went over and asked Paul, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Please. I hope he says no. Paul says, yes. I certainly am. I too am a Roman citizen, the commander said. And it cost me plenty. But Paul answered, he said, "Mm, but I'm a citizen by birth. Woo! The soldiers who were about to interrogate Paul quickly, woo, quickly got out of there, quickly withdrew when they heard that he was a Roman citizen. And the commander was very frightened because he had ordered him bound and whipped. Does citizenship matter? Listen, if earthly citizenship matters, how much more does our heavenly citizenship matter? But you got to speak up. The devil can't have his way with you. The devil can't do whatever he wants with you. What if Paul wouldn't have said anything? They just would have whip, whipped him, whipped that boy. They just would have whipped him, but he spoke up. You got to know where you're from. You got to know where your citizenship is. Our citizenship is in heaven. Thank you, Lord. Speak up. Awesome. You are a part of the church, the body of Christ. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12. First Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to read all this. Y'all good with that? Not the whole chapter. Yeah, the whole chapter. Let's read the whole chapter. Now, dear brothers and sisters, are we brothers and sisters? Come on. Now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about the special abilities the Spirit gives, I don't want you to misunderstand this. You know that when you were still pagans, Gentiles, part of the nations, it's the same word, I looked it up, you were led astray and you were slept, you were not slept, you were swept along in worshiping speechless idols. So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except for by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it's the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. Mm. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another and to someone else. The Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles. You sticking with me here? And, and another, the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability. This is another, another. This is the gift. This is the thing. This is the thing. Let's go to verse 12. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews. Some of us are Gentiles. What we talked about earlier is what the church is made of. Some of us are Jews. Some of us are Gentiles. Some are slaves and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. You are are a part 
of the body of Christ. You, by yourself, are not the body of Christ. You are a part of the body. Let's go down to, um, oh, this is, this is funny. Verse 15, if the foot says, like if our feet could talk, I'm not part of the body because I'm not the hand, does it make it any less part of the body? And if the ear says I'm not part of the body because I'm an eye, would that make it any less part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if the whole body were an ear, how would you smell? But our bodies have many parts, and God put each part where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. That would be so weird. Like if I was just a large ear up here. Like, I, don't, I couldn't even stand. Someone would have to throw me up here, and I would just be on the ground, an ear. Wouldn't do anything for anybody. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there's many parts, but only one body. Many parts, one body. Are you the body? Kind of. By yourself, are you the body? Are you a part of the body? Cool. Okay. Are you an ear? I am a pinky toe. Y'all don't want to see my pinky toe. All right. Calm down. Verse 22, this is awesome. In fact, some of the body that seems the weakest and the least important are actually the most necessary. Man, isn't that true? Any runners in here? Not me. We had one hand. One runner. This is great. This is going to go over good. Um, anybody in here that likes to work out? Anybody in here that likes to be active? Anybody in here that likes to hike? That should be like everybody. We live in Colorado. Okay. Some of the parts that seem the weakest or the least important are actually the most necessary. You may not be thinking about all the little tendons and all the parts that make up your body until it hurts or until it's weak. You're running a race. You're feeling good. <laughs> My dad has always, well, not anymore probably, but he used to say he could beat me in a 100-yard dash or 100 meter. I can't remember what it was, something. I was like, there's no way. And in my mind, I just see us running, and we're going good. And then he pulls a hamstring. That's what happens in my mind. We'll probably never race. Dad, if you want to race, I'll race you. But you're not thinking about your hamstring or the tendons that connect all of it until, ah, until it hurts. Let me say this real quick. That being a part of the body, if you want to be strong, whatever your part is, whether you're a tendon, a knee, a foot, an ear, and whatever you are, you want to be strong. If you're not strong, you're weak. What happens when you're running a race and you've got a weak part of your body? What is that part susceptible to? Getting hurt. You got to stay strong. You don't want to get hurt. It's up to you. Awesome. Um, where are we at? Verse 23. Let's go to verse, verse 25. It says, this makes for harmony among the members, the members of the body, so that all the members can care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. One part suffering, you can't run the same if something's hurt. Something's weak. You don't want to be a weak part. Strong part. Oh, a strong cell. Okay. Verse 27, all of you together are Christ's body. Are you by yourself Christ's body? No. All of us together are Christ's body, and each one of you is a part of it. Here are some parts that God has appointed for the church. The body. And it goes through and lists some things. We might come back to that here in a second. Everybody says, or you hear, maybe not everybody, you hear a lot of people say, I want to be a part of something. 
I want to be a part of something bigger than myself. I want to be a part of something powerful. I want to be a part of a move of God. You literally are. Like, <laughs> like do, you, do you see it? You literally are a part of the body. How does the body do anything? If I'm on the couch at my house and I want a coffee, how do I get the coffee? I got to move. I can't just like take my head off. Like, Jesus, do it for me. He's the head, right? Just poop, pop, choo. Like, it might like hit the coffee maker, hit the power button, turn it on, but it doesn't make the coffee. It doesn't actually make the coffee. You literally are a part of the body. The body is how the Lord Jesus, who is the head of our body, moves. It's like how you move. You literally are. Don't let the enemy deceive you that you're not a part of something great or that you're trying to find like, oh, where, where is the move of God? Where is it? Oh, maybe it's in that church in that city. Oh, maybe it's in that church. Where is the move? Oh, that, God, that place has got a lot of people going to it. Like, that's the move. Like, no, the church is the move, the moving of his body. You already are. Don't, let, don't be looking for something just super spectacular or like, man, you already are a part of the move, the body of Christ. You are a part of the move of God already. You are it. Okay, point made. Man. If you're saying or you hear yourself say, ah, I just don't see, I don't see God moving in my life. I just don't see a move of God. I would encourage you today to ask yourself if you're doing your part. Because if the part is in place and the body is moving, you will see the move of God in your life. I almost did the robot for a second. Man. Woo! Don't get me stirred up. Too late. Let's look at some people who did their part. Let's go read about Paul. It's awesome reading about the guys in the New Testament doing their part. It's awesome. What's Paul's part? Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to go, I guess we'll start in verse 1. My mind is trying to figure out where Ephesians is. It's one, there it is. I found it. It was hidden, and there it is. Okay. Ephesians chapter 3. Let's just read. <laughs> We might read all of it. Let's see. We're doing good on time. When I think of all this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ, for the benefit of the Gentiles. That's, that's part of Paul's part. It's part of Paul's part. He is to be a benefit, do his part, to preach the good news, to preach the word of God to the nations, the Gentiles. That was me. Assuming, by the way, that you know that God gave me, my part, God gave me the special responsibility of extending his grace to you Gentiles, to the nations. As I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan. It's a mysterious mystery. He revealed his, does anybody know what movie that's from? I don't. He revealed this mystery, this secret, to me, he revealed the secret of the church being preached to the Gentiles through Paul. Paul's playing his part. As you read what I have written, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to previous generations. It was hidden. But now by his spirit, 
he has revealed it to his holy apostles and prophets. And here it is. And this is God's plan. This is the secret. This is the mystery. This is what was hidden. Ain't nobody know about it. Both the Gentiles and the Jews who believe the good news, they share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part, a part of the same body. And both enjoy the promise of the blessings because they belong to Christ. By God's grace and mighty power, I've been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. Though I'm the least deserving of all of God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them. How thankful are you today that Paul did his part? I am so thankful Paul did his part. If you think that you can get everything you need by yourself from God, you can't. You can't. If that were the case, why would Jesus need Paul to write all these letters to tell us about who God is, about who we are in Christ, if we just could have got it ourselves? No, he needed someone to play their part, someone to do their part. Verse 9, I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of the things of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose in all this, this is awesome, this is us, God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That's where we're from. This was the eternal plan that he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Ooh, I'm so thankful Paul did his part. When we get to heaven someday, somebody is going to be thankful that you did your part. Somebody is going to come up to you and say, hey, if it hadn't been for you doing what the Lord called you to do, mmm. Do your part. It's important for us to do our part. Let's go to Ephesians 4. Turn the page. Oh, wait. No, we're not done. We got to keep going. Okay, back to Ephesians 3. This was the his eternal plan. This is awesome. No, we're going back. We're going to read this again. Verse 10. God's purpose in all this was to use the church. Thank you. That was the guy who was running. Just kidding. He's somewhere else. God's plan in all this was to use. One more time. God's plan in all this was to use. Use the church. To use the church. Not for the church to lay home, sleeping in bed, hanging out by themselves. Nope. Use the church. To display his wisdom and its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This is his eternal plan, which he carried out through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's skip over to, oh, verse 16. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, that he will strengthen you with inner strength by his spirit. Where do our unlimited resources come from? Heaven. Where are we from? Heaven. Fill you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. Your roots will grow down deep. They will grow down into God's love and they'll keep you strong. Are we being strengthened this year? Woo, we being perfected this year? Come on. That's stirred up. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all of God's people should. Like, you should understand doesn't mean you do. Like, but he'll give you the power to. Okay. How wide, how long, how high, how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ. Though it is too great to understand fully... 
Part of it we see, part of it we don't. I mean, we're, we're walking by faith, but some secrets have been revealed. Some things have been made known. Some things we don't know yet. Yeah. Keep going. May experience the love of Christ through, though it's too great to fully understand, then you will be made complete. We've been talking about that for a few weeks. You will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Oh, we're getting to our church scripture here. Our church, Legacy Church, a part of the church. Ephesians 3.20. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us, within the body, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. God can do more through the body than we get. Woo, that's awesome. Verse 21, glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. That's our church scripture. That is legacy church, a part of the church. That's our scripture. Okay, chapter 4. Man, chapter 4. Let's start in verse 1. Just keep going. Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called of God. He is begging them to lead a life worthy of your calling. Verse um, verse 1, oh, I don't, I don't know where it's at. Can you put up the New King James? I can't remember where this is, guys. Maybe you can just tell me. In another translation, it says, the high calling. Anybody know where that's at? Maybe NIV? I guess it's NIV. It's probably the NIV. Live a life worthy of your high calling. That word high is the root word of the word we saw earlier, anothen, which means from above or a heavenly calling. Live a life worthy of your heavenly calling. It's the, from, yeah, there it is, from John chapter 3 when Jesus said to be born again. It's the same, it's the root word of that word, anno. No Greek scholar here. I just thought it was cool. Thank you, Lord. We are the body of Christ. Can you say, I am a part of the body of Christ? You're a part. We all play a part. All right, let's move on. Who else are we? <laughs> I want to know. Let's go to Ephesians we're just moving right along here in the Bible. We don't have to turn or anything. Ephesians chapter 5. Let's go to verse. Oh, let's go to verse 21. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord for a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Verse 25. For husbands, this means to love your wives, as Christ has loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself a glorious church. What does Ephesians 3.21 say? To him be glory through the church, in the church. Present to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. Can you see he's talking about us? Holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body and but feeds and cares for it, 
just as Christ cares for the church and we're members of his body. Jesus don't hate you. You're part of his body. He loves you, caring for you. Verse 31, as the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery. It's a great secret. What's this secret about? It's about the church, Jesus and the church. This is a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. In verse 31, it says, A man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. Who's our father? God. Who's our mother? The Bible says the mother to us all is heavenly Jerusalem. Heaven. Jesus had to leave heaven, his mother, the motherland, had to leave the motherland and his father and be joined into one with his wife, the church. Woo! That stirs me up. This is about us. I mean, it's also about like our marriages, but it's about us. It's like, it's like here's deep, and then, okay, there it is also. There's a little deeper. Wow. That's awesome. Present her a glorious church. That's what the Bible calls us. A glorious church. A church filled with his glory. Are you filled with his glory? Oh, whether you feel it or not, or whether you believe it or not, you are. You are filled. If you're a believer, you're filled with his glory. Thank you, Lord. Let's read um, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. Wrong way. Paul said in verse 2, I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. Oof. A pure bride. What did Jesus say about the church? We, we see that, we know he gave revelation to Paul and that he uh, gave revelation to different people about the church. But what did he say when he was on the earth about the church? Um, let's go to Matthew 16. I believe from what I looked at and saw, I could be wrong, that he only mentions, Jesus only says the word church twice, which is the word ecclesia. Um, that's Matthew 16, 18, and then also Matthew 18, 17. I'm sure there's something there in Matthew 18, 17, but I want to focus in on Matthew 16, 18. Still not there yet. So close. Nope. There it is. Matthew 16, 18. Verse 13. He asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Verse 14. Well, they replied, some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. And others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. So he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter croaked up. I love Peter. He's awesome. Peter croaked up and he said, <laughs> answered, not croaked. He answered. <laughs> Peter answered and he said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, hey, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven revealed this to you. You didn't learn this from a human being. You didn't er learn this from an earthly point of view like, ooh, you got some revelation here. You didn't learn this from a human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. 
and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom, and whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Hmm. It says that, you're, that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, these are two different rocks. Everybody's heard this. Maybe not everybody's heard this. A lot of people have heard this and talked about it. But Peter basically means a rock or a stone. And the next one, one is Petro. Let's see, which one is it? Do I have it written down? So Peter is the Greek word Petros, a rock or a stone. And then the next rock word that he used is Petra, which represents Jesus, the rock, the stone, the chief cornerstone. 1 Peter 2.5 says that you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. You are not the stone. You are a stone. You are a rock. And Jesus is building his church with you. Using you. Awesome. Let's read about Jesus' first miracle. John chapter 2. I got so stirred up this week reading this. I was crying. I was, it was awesome. Can we just ask the Lord to help us with this part? Because I want to communicate it clearly. And I want to say it directly in line with the word. And how he meant for it to be seen. So, Lord, we ask you to show us and help us. Give us wisdom by your spirit. Oh, this is awesome. So we are the body. We are the bride. Woo! Pretty awesome. Okay. John chapter 2. Here we go. The next day, there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Huh. And Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. That phrase, a wedding celebration, is also the same phrase used in the book of Revelation, chapter 19. Let's look at this. Hold your place in John 2, because we're just, we're going to be flipping Revelation 19. Almost there. I got one hand. Okay, Revelation 19. Verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice, and let us give honor to him, for the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb. It is the same phrase used. The wedding feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let's keep reading. She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear. Oh, a garment of salvation. For the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. Verse 9, And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited. We We just read that, that they were invited. Jesus and his disciples were invited to the celebration. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast. Of the Lamb. Man. Verse 2. And Jesus and disciples were also invited to the celebration. I just read mother there and I, I couldn't help but think about the motherland where we're from. Heaven was present. Heaven's just, just waiting. Could be wrong, just what I saw. The wine supplies, verse 3. The wine supply ran out during the festivities. So Jesus' mother told him they have no more wine. 
what is wine a representation of? The Spirit. We see in Philippians chapter 1, verse 19, it says, For I know that this shall turn out to my salvation through your supplication and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God is the new wine. They have no more wine. Jesus says, dear woman, that's not our problem. (laughs) That's just how I read it. Maybe you didn't say it like that. Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. Verse 5, but his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. The servants, do whatever he tells you. This word servants is the Greek word, help me out, Lord, diakonos, where we get the word deacon from, which means minister or a servant or a deacon. It means someone to run errands. It also means one who executes the commands of another. It's also referred to as a waiter or a deacon, someone working in the church, or a servant of the king. It's the same word, same word that means all those things. I was a waiter for like, I don't know, maybe almost five years. I was a waiter. I waited tables. I served tables. Um, and my first job as a server was at a little old Italian restaurant that was not good. But the only reason I got the job is because I was there. I, I was working for someone, I was working for another company, and I happened just to be in the building, and I, nobody was coming in to do what I was there for. And then the manager of the restaurant, like, just, we would always talk, always talk. He's like, man, you want to serve here? I'm like, yeah. I was like, make more money here than no, I'm doing nothing. So, but in that, part of it's just doing, I was just doing a part. I was just there. I, I got used, promoted. I got a, a better job just because I was there. Just doing a part. Trying to do a part. It wasn't what I felt like I was called to do, but I was doing a part. Steps. But then I worked there for like a year. That, that place closed down because it wasn't any good. And um, I got a job. There was this, um, at the Hilton in, in my town, there was a, a restaurant opening, a really nice restaurant, a nice steakhouse opening. And I was just thinking like, man, if I can just get a server job there, I'm going to make bank. It's going to be awesome. I mean, I'm like single. I'm like 18, you know. Like I live with my parents. I, live in the, I literally lived in their basement. And um, I was like, this is going to be awesome. So I went and applied for a server job, and I went and did the interview. And they liked me, but they're like, hey, you can't, you can't be a server. I'm like, why? Like, you don't have enough experience. I was like, what do you mean? And this is funny. In, in light of John chapter 2, I couldn't be a server. I couldn't be a servant. I couldn't serve the people because I didn't have any wine experience. Like, like you don't know anything about wine, so you can't, you can't serve the people. So they offered me a busser position. <laughs> and at this point in my life, I had literally just met Courtney, and we had just started dating. I could cry thinking about it. And, um, oh. We just started dating, and I thought, oh, I just lost my job as a server, and here I can't even be a server. I have to be, I, I, I can't, I can't be a busser. It's like, I can't tell Courtney I'm a busser. I can't tell Courtney's dad I'm a busser. I'm like, he's got his own business. He's like doing his thing, you know, like. I was like, I can't, I thought, a busser, like, I got to, like, do the, you know, dishes and carry them out. Like, I don't have, a, I don't have, a, I don't have the place that I want. Ah, I don't want to be a busser. The Lord told me to do it. I was like, oh, gosh. I don't even know if I'd met your parents yet. But I don't even remember if your dad asked me what I, I was like, Lord, please don't, don't, 
don't let him ask me. I'm like, I'm the president. I'm like, no, <laughs> you're a busser. I thought, it was, I thought it was just too low of a position. Oh, I just thought like, man, it's just not enough for me. That's not what I'm called to do. That's not big enough. That's not the position I want. That's not the place I want. God said, do it. I said, okay. I think I was a buster there for three months, three or four months. The restaurant just started. This restaurant was nice. I mean, in our, later within our first year or two, the only Hiltons that did better than us was the one in New York. It was awesome. It was a cool steakhouse. But I'm not preaching about a steakhouse. <laughs> the meat of the word of God. Maybe I am preaching about a steakhouse. <laughs> The church, the steakhouse of God. <laughs> it kind of works. Hey, I like it. Oh, my gosh. Where am I here? <laughs> yeah. Oh, here we, here we are. Sorry. They said I wasn't ready. I, I, wasn't, I didn't know anything about the wine, a.k.a. the spirit, but we'll just say the wine here. I didn't have any experience with wine service. But after doing this for three or four months, I came into work one afternoon. The afternoons, like we were like a nighttime restaurant. That's when we were busy, but we're hotels, so we're always open. So I come in one afternoon. They have me on schedule to be a busser. I'm the only one. I walk in there, and the server doesn't show up. It was one busser and one server. The server doesn't show up. My manager comes up to me and he says, hey, I'm going to need you to serve today. And I was like, cool. He's like, we got nothing going on. Like, we don't have any tables coming in. Like, nothing, nothing reserved. I'm like, well, it's going to be an easy day. He said, we just have one 14 top, which is 14 people, but it's from people that work in the hotel that they're just, like, doing something for. So I have this table of 14 people, they come in. I'm serving them by myself. I am the server. I am also the busser <laughs> because I was the busser, and now I'm the server. And then somebody else walks in, a guy and five of his friends. This guy owns maybe still made his own, he owns the other steakhouse in town that's super nice. He comes in with, so I'm thinking like, this is our competition. <laughs> this guy knows all about steakhouse, like he knows about service and waiters, so the six top, I got a 14 top, and I got a six top. I'm like, okay, I can do this, I'm all by myself. That's a lot of people for one person. Why aren't you like, oh, are you okay? Yeah, I'm going to be okay. <laughs> then, then, Another group comes in, so I'm, I'm 14 people. I'm serving 14 people, six people. But you want water? But I'm actually not doing it like that. It's like a really nice place, so I'm being very attentive. And then another people, another group of people walk in. It's the mayor. <laughs> it's the mayor and three other people I can't remember. The mayor walks in. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is. This is crazy. Like, what is going on? Then I'm serving, and then another group of people walk in. It is literally the regional director of Hilton of food and beverage. With my manager over the whole hotel. I was like, not my manager at the restaurant, but like the hotel manager. I was like, oh my gosh, and he's got like, I can't remember, is this them too, or I can't remember, whatever. I served my butt off. <laughs> I was, they didn't see me running, but I was running. I mean, I was running back there sweating, came to the table, what can I do for you? <laughs> whatever. Oh man, just serving them up. That day, I be, if I get this story right, it may have not been every table, but I believe my restaurant manager came and told me later that each table came to him after they finished their meal and said that was the best service I've ever had. 
I was like, are you serious? I'm a busser. I'm just a busser. He told me, he's like, you're not bussing tables no more. Oh, doing a part. Just doing a part. Showing up. You may not think it's great. It may not want to be everything you see in your heart that you want to be. It may not be all your heart's desires. I want to go to Zanzibar. I don't know. Bubba Treasure Island. I want to go to somewhere and just preach and do this. I, I, want to, like, I, don't, I don't want to be a busser. Like, I don't want them to do the stuff and I got to do all the dirty work. Literally do all the dirty work. But kept showing up. Kept playing a part. One day someone doesn't do their part. Uh-oh. Somebody else got to step in. Somebody else has got to do their part. I get promoted to being a server. This is what Jesus is talking about. Servants. Where is that? In verse 5, he said, He told the servants, the deacons, or the lower level is the waiters, the deacons, the servants of the king. He told them, do whatever he tells you. Sorry, his mother told him to do whatever he tells you. Let's keep going. Do whatever he tells you. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you will obey. You will do my commands. You will do what I tell you. Verse 16 says, and I'll give you the Holy Spirit, the new wine. Woo! I mean, I'm just seeing it here. John 14, John 2, talking about the servants, talking about wine service. I mean, they actually poured in water, which we'll get to, but turns the wine. He turns and he says, oh, should we read that? Okay, Luke 6, 46. So John 14, if you love me, you will, you will obey me. You'll do my commandments. You'll do what I tell you. Okay, John, no, Luke 6, 46. That's the wrong way. Help us, Lord. He said, so why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. Sounds like John 2. Whatever he says, do you do it? It's like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock, the chief cornerstone. I added that in. doesn't say it right there. When the flood rises up and breaks against that house, it stands firm. It's well built. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house without a foundation. When the flood sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap over. Who is the house? We are the house. We are the body. We are the temple. We're the house. Woo! Servants. Digging deep. It's not easy to dig deep. It's not easy to dig deep. And they lay a foundation on solid rock Jesus. Oh, dig deep. I couldn't help but think about Jeremy and Sarah. Don't make me cry. I couldn't help about the servants of God. Oh, Jeremy and Sarah who have given their lives for this church, a part of the church, to dig deep. It's not easy to dig deep. It's not easy to dig deep. It takes something of you. It takes some strength. You got to dig deep just so that we can be built on Jesus. Woo, I'm so thankful for our pastors, our servants that God has given us. So thankful. Okay, we're going back. John 2, John 2. Wrong way. Everybody doing good still? Have you had enough scriptures? Where are we at? What, what verse are we in? Okay, here we go. Verse 5, but his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Verse 6, standing nearby were six stones, six stone water jars. Six is the number of man. We are called jars of clay. We are earthen vessels. 
We are the water jars used for the Jewish ceremonial of washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus told the servants, the ministers, the pastors, the preachers, the ones serving at church, fill the jars, fill the people with water. Woo! Fill the people with water. The New King James, James, James the New King James version says that he to fill the jars with water to the brim. That word or that phrase to the brim is the same word we saw earlier. It's that root word anno, which means above. Or when Jesus said in John 3, Anno then born again, you must be born from above. It's the same word, same root word. Fill them up to the brim. You got to be born again. You got to be born from above, from a higher place. What is water? What does the word, what does water do in the word? Well, we know that water can represent the word. And we know that the word brings salvation. Isaiah 12, 3 says, With joy you will drink deeply from the fountain of salvation. The New King James Version of Isaiah 12 says, Therefore with joy you will draw water. You will draw water from wells of salvation. Ephesians 5.26 says to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. you got to be washed by the water of the word. How are you saved? By faith. How does faith come? By hearing and hearing by the word, the water. you got to be preached. Romans 10.17 New King James Version. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How will they hear? Romans 10, 14. How can they hear, but how can they call on him to save them for salvation? How can they call for salvation unless they believe in him? They can't. And how can they believe if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? The servants. The servants brought the water. The servants brought the word. That's what we're called to, church, to bring the word of God, to bring the word of salvation all to every person on the earth. Don't get me stirred up. Someone's got to bring The word. Verse 9. We're getting through it. Verse 9. When the master of the ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, earlier we read about you got to be born of water and of the Spirit. Was water, was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew. He called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then when everyone has a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine, but you've kept the best wine until you kept the best for last. Woo! The church. The last days. Come on, that's us. Getting pumped. Verse 11. This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory. What is one of the ways Jesus reveals his glory? It's our church scripture. Through the church. Jesus is talking about the church here. Woo. Let's go on. Peter. Let's talk about Peter. Got a couple more minutes here. We see in uh, Matthew 18, or sorry, Matthew 16, 13 through 19, we talked about Peter being a stone. Talk about Jesus being the chief cornerstone. On this revelation, I will build my church. We know 1 Peter 2, 5 says that you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. Let's keep going. Ah, oh, man, thank you, Lord. 
1 Peter 2, chapter, sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. It says, you are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you're his holy priests. Mm. New King James Version says, Coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up. Sounds like something we've been hearing about for a bit. Being complete, perfect, established, strengthened. Woo! You're being built up a spiritual house, a temple, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. A holy priesthood. Man, Peter's talking about us, talking about our future. 2 Timothy 2.12 says that we will reign with Christ. Revelation 5, 9 through 10. Check this out. And they sang a new song with these words, You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you are slaughtered. Who's he talking about? Jesus. You are slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, the church. And you have caused them, the church, to become a kingdom of priests for our God. This is what Peter was talking about. A spiritual house, a holy priesthood, a kingdom of priests for our God, and they will reign on or a position over the earth. We have been made a kingdom of priests. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's go to a second Peter chapter three. Mm. Are you excited about the day you're living in? Oh, the age of the church. Are you excited about where we're headed? What we're going to be doing for eternity? This is awesome. We're going to rule and reign with him throughout all eternity. It's what we're called to. We just read it in Peter. Go check it out for yourself. Go read it some more. Um, Second Peter chapter 3. This is kind of what I feel like today. I kind of feel like what Peter's saying here in this first verse. Peter says, this is my second letter to you, dear friends. And in both of them, both of my letters, I've tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. I want you to remember what the holy prophet said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded through your apostles. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last Days in the days, the church age, in the latter days, the days of the church, scoffers will come, mock the truth, and they will follow their own desires. Verse 4 through 7 talks about what awaits the ungodly. That ain't us, though. We're the church, we're God's people. Verse 8. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. Do you think that? Yeah, he's not. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise. No, he's being patient. He's being patient for your sake. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed. But he wants everyone to repent, to come to himself. He's being patient. Man, I'm just going to watch myself if I, my mom's in heaven. So I do long. Woo! It's a real place. I long to go and see her again. 
So I'm just going to watch myself. I'm like, Lord, why is it taking so long? Why is it taking? You know why? He's being patient. It does, he doesn't want anybody to not be a part of his family. He's given opportunity. He's given chance. He's given time. How will they know? The church. They're going to know through the church. The head ain't just going to pop on the earth and it's the body. They're going to know through us. Verse 11 of chapter 3 says, Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. Woo! You want to know how to live a holy life? You want to know how to live a godly life? Be mindful of heaven. All set your mind on things above, not things beneath. When you have a heavenly mindset, you'll get stirred up to talk about it. You'll get stirred up to bring salvation. You'll get stirred up to preach the word. You'll get stirred up to go into all the world. Woo! And pre- I'm getting stirred up. We got a part. What's the Great Commission? Go into the world. Let's just read it. Matthew 20, 28. We're almost done. Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go, here, I'll back up, 18. Jesus came and he told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. Who's all the nations? Church. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and in the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey the commands I have given you. That's the same thing that we saw in John 2. Do what he says. And be sure of this. I am with you even till the end of the age. Ooh. Oh, hi, guys. Even till the end of the age. I'm with you even till the end of the age. Let's read Colossians 1.28. You know, this is part of our church scripture. It's a Pearson's Ministries scripture. Colossians 1.28. Colossians 1.28. Oh, can we just back up to 27? Oh, I want to keep going back a little bit more, but we're, we're oh, maybe we, just, just read, just glance up and see about the secret, the church, the message. Oh, okay. Verse 28. Nope, 27. For God wanted them to know the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this is the secret, that Christ lives in you. You've been born again. This gives you an assurance of sharing his glory. Ooh, glory in the church. Verse 28, so we tell others about Christ, warning everyone. Does this sound like the Great Commission? Warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom God's given us. We want to present them to God. Huh, that's what Paul said. Maybe this is Paul too, maybe it is, I don't know. He said it again. If this is Paul, I don't know. That's why I work. This is Paul, isn't it? Yeah, it is. We want to present them to God, perfect in their relationship with Christ, the bride of Christ, presenting him a glorious church, the bride. That's why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's power that works in me. It ain't about doing nothing. It's about working, but not in yourself. It's about moving, being a part, but not just a part by yourself. Like, what if a weird little tendon was just out here? It'd be so weird. No. No. We've got to depend on Christ's mighty power that works within us. How will his glory be revealed? How, do, how does the world see Jesus? Isaiah 6 says, The train of his robe fills the temple. We saw in 1 Peter that we are a temple. 
The train of his robe fills the temple, and the whole earth is filled with his glory. How is his whole how is the earth filled with his glory? The church. Oh, we're all over. We're apart here in Colorado. We're just apart. The whole earth will be filled with this glory. Verse 21 of 1 Corinthians 3.16. No, we'll just read it. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, All of you together are the temple. All of you together are the temple. Verse 21 in that talks about no human leader, because they're all boasting about, oh, I'm of Paul, I'm of whoever. No human can be the leader. We can only be a part of the body. No human can be the leader. We are only a part. Don't get caught up on people. Just do your part. Not everyone's a pastor. Not everyone's going to work in the church. Not everyone's called to the fivefold ministry. A lot of you probably are. But everyone is a part. And that is where our life is found. That's what our life revolves around is getting the word out. No matter if the Lord's called you to, to own a business. No matter if the Lord's called you to do whatever it is. It could be anything. Or maybe he's called you to work at the, earth, the church here on earth. We all have a part. Here's the thing, though. Just like whenever I was a busser at that restaurant, you don't have to know the fullness of your part. You may, you, you may, that was may might, you might mate. You might, you might see it. You might have a little bit of revelation of what the Lord's called you to do. Some of it might be known. Some of it may not be known. That would be a secret. Secrets, we know that they're not hidden from us, but they're hidden for us to find. I would just encourage everyone to step out and play a part, even if it's something that you think is ins insignificant, something maybe you don't want to do. But that initial move to do what God's called you to do, that initial move to play your part will catapult you into the full plan that God has for your life. Don't neglect those small, what we might see as small things. We know that the Lord, it's not small, but just something like a smaller thing, whether it's coming to help out on the church during the week or whatever it could be. Look for an opportunity to move. Look for an opportunity to be a part don't look for a title. Don't look for a place. Don't look for a position. That ain't about the body. That's about you. You're not thinking about the body if you're thinking about the part. Don't be thinking about the position. God will give you position. God will give you. We already know he's given us place. We've seen it. But even now in this time, God will give you position. God, let him do it. It'll make it so special. It will make it so special. The local church is a part of the church of God. I believe it's, it's the way that, that we move. Serving in the local church. Doing what God's called you to do. Thank you, Lord. Find the church, the local church, that God has called you to so that you can do your part in the church. Whew. Find your part in the local church. Find the local church God's called you to so that you can do the your, sorry, that you can do your part in the church to get the gospel to every person. Whew. This is Jesus' heart. This is why he's being patient. This is why he's waiting. Because the word's got to go to every man. Aren't you thankful the Lord's given us a church here? A part? A church here in Colorado that we can be a part in this? Oh, thank you, Lord. Would you stand with me today?
I wrote this down. Sometimes the body doesn't feel like moving. You ever felt like, like, I don't feel like getting up. One of the best ways to get the stiffness out is to move. You know in the Bible, <laughs> when you're called a stiff-necked group of people, not us, not us. You feel stiff? You feel stuck in life? Oh, I just feel stuck. You gotta move. You need to go play a part. You need to go do your part. Oh, get loosened up. Get free. Get free. Thank you, Lord. Is that you today? Are you a part of the church? Are you the body of Christ? Are you the bride of Christ? Oh, are we living in the day of the church? Oh, has the Lord graced us and strengthened us? Father, we love you today. Oh, we love you today. We love you. We love you today. We're so thankful to be yours, a part of your body, called to you for eternity. Thank you, Lord. Are you excited to find your part? Man, can I just offer the invitation of salvation today? Is there anybody in this room today whew, that doesn't know the Lord? That isn't a part of his church, his body. Is there anybody here today? You don't have to be ashamed. This is awesome. If, if you are here, would you raise your hand for me? Anybody at all? There might be some people watching online or who would see this. Oh, so let's pray together. Father, let's repeat it after me. Father, we love you today. We thank you for your word. Oh, thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus to die for me. Oh, thank you, Lord. I receive him today. I receive salvation today. Oh, that he rose for me. Oh, Father, I'm free by his blood today. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Are you stirred up today? Are you happy today? Out. Man, we are the body of Christ. We have a part today. So as you go, I just ask you to go before the Lord, to maybe evaluate yourself. Like, man, am I stiff in life? Man, you just gotta come play a part if you wanna move. That's all it is. You don't have to be stuck. You don't gotta be stiff, but you can't find it anywhere else than in his church. Not just this church, the church. This is a part, there's a lot of parts. Thank you, Lord. Well, I love you guys today. Man, I'm just so thankful that the Lord would trust me today to bring this word to you. I hope that your hearts were open and you received it. Amen. Thank you, Lord. What is it when we always, that we say when we go? Somebody help me. Oh, there we go. Today at Legacy Church, we are believing that you will always be in the right place at the right time doing the right thing with the right people. Love you today. Have a good day. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed this message. If you need someone to pray with you, there are several ways for you to contact us. Feel free to give us a call at 817-577-0180. You can also contact us through the Legacy Studios app or either of our websites. Giving options are available online at pearsonsministries.com and legacychurch.family. If you prefer, you can also text an offering. Simply text LEGACY in any dollar amount to the number 28950 and follow the prompts. Be blessed today. We love you. And remember, you are always welcome here in the house of faith.